hope everyone has a copy of my handout and um, the points of the handout follows uh, the order of my talk. So I won't make specific reference to the points later. Um, as one of the post, a guide to early Irish law generation of student, I share the same anxiety with others when I was writing my undergraduate thesis on early Irish law that it contained too many citations from that seminal and comprehensive book. Professor Fergus Skelly is a tall man and his profound knowledge of normative aspects of Irish law and of the social practices crystallized in law tracts makes his shoulders particularly high ones to stand on. The main pursuit in studying early Irish law today remains, and well should remain, a normative approach to the rules and principles spelled by the obscure language, aiming towards recovering the original regulations and the subsequent development. In this paper, however, I wish to treat early Irish law not as an abstract system of rules, but as concrete text that were objects of writing and reading practices, and to see what textual strategies this text have employed to connect law to the larger scheme of the learned tradition. The term of the learned tradition of medieval Ireland, Shanfas, does not match easily with any single modern discipline. Boundaries between genre under the rubric of this term are fluid. What we today distinguish as distinct branches of learning, law, history, grammar, toponymy, and literature, overlapped considerably with each other in medieval Ireland. The nature of Shanahas has attracted much attention from modern scholars, and a consensus had graduated arisen that on the one hand, regardless of its possible oral or written uh, origin, Shanahas was a textual tradition. On the other, one must keep a cautious eye on the historicity of its account of the past. Nowadays, we are more disillusioned than ever with the so-called mimetic approach to the narratives offered by Shanghas. Many texts, which purport to be historiography, can be shown to be, in fact, allegorical tales invented in the later era to comment on contemporary circumstances. The Ulster cycle is no longer a window of the Iron Age but an imagined picture of a heroic past on the part of monastic scribes. Similarly, many of the origins of place names as claimed by the Dinkanhas are actually fabrications based on Isidorian etymology. Law texts are less often put to text of historicity, but they contain numerous narratives that may significantly diverge from historical truth as well. For instance, St. Patrick could not have legitimized St. Shanthas Moore as claimed in several passages in that compilation, nor was Brevard Neveth produced by Moran and Afferne. Scientifically speaking, it would have been exceptional if a bee had actually blinded in an eye of Congal Kai. However, this description tally well with accounts in other branches of the Shanthas. The pseudo-historical prologue of Shanthas Moore asserts that St. Patrick's revision of native Irish law took place in Tara after the conversion of Loigre, therefore fitting it into the mainstream patrician chronology as written by Murhu and other hagiographers. A wisdom text bearing many similar features to Breton Neveth, namely Aldach Moran, compiled by Professor Kelly, is credited as is part of Breton Neveth to the preaching of Moran to Neira. Kai, Mark, Mark, Kai McRoy records a similar story about the loss of Congo's eye and its legal consequence. Not to mention that the Milesian legend from the synthetic historical scheme which was fundamental to the whole Shanahas in the later Middle Ages, has been con consciously employed by a number of legal narratives. Questions then arise. Why do law texts incorporate these stories? Why do all branches of the Shanahas, through narratives and by other means, accept and share an invented past as their common background? If the accounts of the past offered by Shanahas are neither ancient nor <coughs> historically accurate, how did they acquire their authority and prestige so as to certify and direct the present? How did they become part of the tradition in the first place? It is difficult to determine whether these accounts were simply make-believes for the unsuspecting audience, forged by Irish predecessor of Geoffrey of Monmouth or, uh, and James Macpherson, but at least for the learned class of medieval Ireland who were responsible for devising this account wholesale credulity was quite unlikely. Erich Popper has shown that the medieval concept of historia, which is essential to Shanhas, was not one concerned with historicity in the positivist sense. Rather, 
Historia was a textual genre which formed part of the collective and interpretative memoria of the past <coughs> by the creation of <coughs> chronologically and intertextually related accounts. Meanwhile, recent anthropological studies of other cultures have suggested that we should stop regarding tradition as a fixed set of texts or customs. We should instead focus on the ongoing process of traditionalization, a process which systematically links text to, the, to a conceived meaningful past. The quality of being traditional, namely traditionality, is a notion of social function rather than of temporal relation. Once constructed as traditional, texts acquire their functional authority regardless of their actual provenance and historicity. The same can be said about the shankas, including law texts in general. What makes, a part, what makes a text part of a tradition is not its age or veracity, but its intertextuality with other texts accepted as tradition. In other words, the shankas should be understood not as a given set of texts, but as the intertextuality among an indefinite number of texts and the authority of law texts derives from their affinity with other texts in shankas. Attributing law text to the promulgation or pronouncement of figures who had already been, who had already been established as authoritative in the Shanghas is a straightforward and popular traditionalizing strategy in early Irish law. This topic has been comprehensively covered in Chapter A of uh, Professor Leon Bradnock's Companion. Here, I would like to supply only a few more observations. The situations in which the laws were promulgated or announced are important to the attribution, and therefore many attributions are accompanied by narratives to account for these situations. As Professor Bragnall has shown, a number of narratives employ the Akesus ad autores scheme to introduce such circumstances within the framework of place, time, person, and reason of writing. This scheme was evidently imported from the European tradition of grammatica, in the continental Latin Akesus, however, the locus tempus and persona are mostly a aspect of the author's vita, not of the work itself. In the commentary to Virgil's poems, for instance, locus and tempus almost invariably refer to the poet's hometown and era, rather than to the specific place and time of the composition. The Akesus narratives found in Irish law tracts, by contrast, often explicitly state that the locus and tempus are those of the making of this book, in Lover's Soul. The Irish legal Akesus narratives are strongly text-oriented. Instead of giving a biography of the author, the circumstantial elements place the production of the text in the temporal local greed, so meticulously cultivated by the Irish literati in Shanghurst. In fact, the identity of the author is often ambiguous, if not spurious. A later prologue to Koi Konarafukil a science is making to a poet, Kellner, a name that might be inspired by the quotation in the tract from a lost text, I Kellner. It further refers to the reign of Kafferma Fingune as the time of its composition and the wood of Iluhar at near Tara as, as the place. Although the wood of Iluhar has not been identified, the combination of it and the name Kellner would certainly have reminded an informed reader of the place name Kerna near Tara. On the other hand, as the place name, Kerna is also attested in Munster and is reminiscent of ancient Munster high kingship, of which Kafur Mafingune was a prominent heir. No matter who this Kerna really was, the narrative provided by this Arkesus presents the readers from the possibility of multiple intertextuality which weaves the law text into the web of traditional significance. Such attributions, however, are not always unique or consistent. The Middle Irish introduction to Anfuhil was clearly modelled upon the prologue of, uh, to another law tract, Con Iverfe, to the extent that only the names of the purported composers differ in the two accounts. The Akesus to Anfuhil gives Kumain, who was well trained in Latin learning but did not quite qualify in native law, as the author, perhaps intending Kumaine Foto. Kumaine Foto was a renowned sapiens, but he died in 662, more than decades before the time of composition claimed in the Akesus. Meanwhile, all other elements were copied from the Khan Ifrefer prologue, including the eponymous place name Makfuferfer. 
any well-informed reader in medieval Ireland would not have hesitated to dismiss its historicity. On the other hand, although the prologue to Corn Ifrita appears to contain some historical truth, and we can trust its statement that the time of its composition was during Fingunet Macon Kemarfer's reign, namely from 678 to 695, the effect was, in Binch's words, certainly spoiled by adding that the tract was afterwards shown to St. Patrick after his coming. <laughs> Clearly, historicity was not the concern here. The medieval author's purpose instead, I would speculate, is to link the text with the significant moment in the collective memory. Con Ivrepa was composed by some obscure authors convened under the authority of a petty local king in the late 7th century, but they managed to become traditional or perhaps national by portraying itself as, been, as having been approved by St. Patrick as Shanghas Moore was. Likewise, Anfuhir partakes in the authority of Con Ivrepa by appropriating the letters of Cassus, as well as by attributing the authorship to the long-deceased but not too long deceased Khumeini photo, if it is really he who was intended, a monster figure prominent in both secular and ecclesiastical literary context. Of course, there are many more types of legal narratives than Akesus at Autores, and not all of them credit the text to authoritative figures. Some of them provide background stories to items, names, or incidents alluded to in the text, and some serve as examples of the application of rules of magical devices, or simply of usage of words. How do these narratives traditionalize the law text? As Robin Stacy observes, the narratives avoid mentioning real-life lawyers, but favor legendary figures from the Shankas. Some personages in legal narratives indeed lived in the historical period, such as Ken Feilach, Conquer Kaich, or Dallan Falkern, but they always appear in connection with certain master narratives recognized by Shankas. There are a number of ways for non akesus legal narratives, and for law texts in general to build up intertextuality with other branches of the tradition. The simplest approach, naturally, is to quote or translate directly from other texts, such as the prologue of Brefa Eidgate, which cites from the Dindikanhas and possibly from Alkev Nanegis. Glosses to the first few lines of the Lied of Thali that borrows extensively from Beth Nevev, Kaimar Ture, Aid Conroy, grammatical works, and Middle Irish poetry. And the translations of free renderings of parts of Collectio Canonum Hibernensis in Beth Nevev and elsewhere. We have abundant evidence of the importation of legal narratives into non legal texts as well, such as a section of Schkeller Moholm that was copied from Beth Nevev Toysha, or large portions of Schkeller Nafil Flatha that derives from the Astrukhirt's Axtrichet and the pseudo-historical prologue of Shanks Mar, not to mention the glossaries and commentaries that garner much of their materials from law text. Reference to stories well known in the Shanghas is also a common tactic for making a law text traditional. Biblical tales are often alluded to by keywords only. A passage in Antiochte presents a narrative as a sequel to the story of Kai Mark and Mukrova. The story of Cuchulain killing his son is mentioned in the law text on three occasions, only one of which provides a true narrative. Obviously, in the two other cases, the story, the story plot, otherwise known as Aiden Ingrid Aifri, was considered familiar enough that details could be omitted. Given that the text we know at present are only the tip of an iceberg of what once existed, we cannot be completely sure where the stories that are known now only found in the law text are sole survivors of what were once more widely known. Some narratives were apparently invented by jurists specifically to suit particular context, while the provenances of others are much more obscure. There is reason to believe that the, narratives at be the narrative at the beginning of the Hachrichlicht Hachavali absorbs at once independent saga known to the hell list as Extra Vergus Magleti, but how shall we speculate about the origin of the anecdote known as Finn and the Man in the Tree, or the story about Afrin as prenatal first for the good hell? Moreover, a number of narratives contain statements that are at odds with the literary tradition as it has come down to us, 
such as the describing of Fergus Lacteric, known in the Glauber Kavala as a son of Neveth, an ancestor of the Britons, as a mourn the casualties on the toy, in the toy, or the audacious anachronism of displaying Fergus Malati and Con Kekhachev as contemporaries in the distrain tract, who lived about two centuries apart, according to the chronology provided by the Reganov list and Lauber Gavala. However, despite their dazzling array of novelties and irregularities, legal narratives always complement unfamiliar names and events with better-known figures and plot. For instance, an Ulster king, Karanova, mentioned in Breva Never Toshak, who appears in no other sources and is unlikely to fit in the already crowded regular list of Ulster, had Moran as his coeval. And anecdotes about Avernus' prenatal chant doubtlessly reflect his exacting manner reinforced by poetic power as depicted in other stories about him. None of these narratives, if measured against what we call early Irish literature, qualifies as orthodox. What matters here, however, as again Robin Stacy points out, is the, I quote, authority was constructed by reference to and within a set of recognized cultural clues, end quote. Such cultural clues are often relevant to the nodal points of the Shanachas. As we have seen in the case of Akasu's narratives, the number and prominence of these cultural clues that the text contains are far more important than the harmony in which these clues are organized. The law texts are brought into the sphere of Shanachas by the intertextuality established by the narratives, and their traditionality is therefore ensured. The law texts are also traditionalized by sharing modes of discourse with other texts in Shanghas. Early Irish law texts exhibit a highly variegated range of registers. A distinction has been made by Professor Charles Edwards in his review of CIH between archaic Fanachas, plain prose, and standard Old Irish textbook prose, which originates from Latin learning. But as the assumption that certain linguistic and stylistic features are diagnostic of native and oral provenances, has gradually dropped out of fashion. The division proposed by Professor Leon Bretnow between prose, syllabic rhyming verse, and rosca in medieval Irish texts in general has become more accepted. All three registers proposed by Professor Bretnow coexist in the law text. In terms of modes of discourse, however, I here suggest another categorization, provision, exposition, and narration. Most modern law texts consist, consist solely of provisions which are either apodictic, making unconditional statements, or casuistic, comprising a hypothetical protasis of condition and an apodosis of legal consequence. These two types are also predominant in the provision of our early Irish law. While provisions are characteristic of and unique to law texts, the two other modes of discourse are widely attested in other branches of the textual tradition and help integrate law text into shankas. I shall start with uh, narration. The abundance of narratives in early Irish law text may strike modern jurists as outlandish, but it would be less exotic if we keep in mind that narration is the primary discourse of shankas. Much of early Irish literature, historiography, onomastic law, and hagiography is written in prose or verse narrative. In stark contrast to the timeless universal provision mode, narration is inherently temporal and individual, and thus particularly suitable for documenting a cultural memory. When narration is employed in law texts, it affirms that the law texts are not merely collective collections of norms, but also the product and witness of the long decay of Irish history. Moreover, narration in Irish law texts is not isolated from the written practice in other Shanghas texts. Narratives originating outside the law text lost none of their style and appeal when adopted into legal context, and many narratives of legal origin relate their stories so skillfully and dramatically that they can claim to be literature in every sense of the word. Rhetorical devices employed by literary works are ubiquitous in the legal narratives such as the narrative openers identified by Pronsius Makana or the use of prosimatrum to carry out various textual functions. Narratives appear at the same nodal points of, uh, in law text as in genealogy, glossaries, and the Jin 
They arise in response to questions of religion, supply contextual uh, information, or simplify concepts and words. Regardless of their ultimate origins, the legal narratives were written and functioned in, the same, in much the same way as narratives elsewhere in the Shankas. By using narration, law texts actively participate in forming the Shankas through the temporal uh, personal relationship implied in every narrative and become themselves part of the tradition in the process. The expository mode organizes the provision and offers critical analysis of their words and meanings rather than directly stipulating a rule. Expository passages construct a framework in which provisions are presented and connect general provisions to more detailed ones. Professor Charles Edwards has shown that three stylistic features characteristic of legal exposition are rooted in the Latin grammatical culture, namely etymology, enumeration, and classroom dialogue. While the contents of provisions are native in the sense that they specifically serve the purpose of Irish society, and some of them can indeed be traced to common Celtic backgrounds. They were doubtlessly objectified as test and disposed according to the ideology of Latin grammatica, which embraced all arts and disciplines that were based on text. The expository discourse instructs one in reading, interpreting, amending, and evaluating the provisions in addition to the use of Arcesus Adaltores mentioned above, expository markers derived from the Grammatica tradition are staple ingredients of Irish law text, such as Edon and Aval, Carl and Enhansa, Kidara Neber, Aralio Ondi, Deschimbrecht, etc., and the Latin archetypes. Besides, several law texts actually engage in metatheoretical discussions on issues of Grammatica or deploy grammatical analytic terms to illustrate their content. These features are by no means limited to law text. Scholars have shown the fundamental role of grammatica in the formation of Irish textual tradition, which extend far beyond the simply linguistic context. By participating in the same discursive and interpretative framework with other texts, law texts not only share terms, but also freely exchange the information and perspectives with other constituents of the Shamathas. It is little wonder that one finds such a wide spectrum of approaches in law text, including grammatical, historical, poetic, and theoret theological um, content, and a similar opulence of legal perspective in literature, historiography, and the Dinkantas. Here, as in other parts of Western Europe, grammatica provides the protocol for a text to be interpreted and evaluated by other texts, genre, and discourses, producing a culture that was explicitly intertextual. The share of expository mode and grammatical protocol between law and the rest of Shanghas establish an intertextuality through which law texts are accepted as <coughs> traditional. One final aspect that plays an important role in the traditionalization of the early Irish law is the structure of the law text. In the later Middle Ages, the canonical parts of the law compiled in the 7th and 8th centuries had indeed become archaic and had been consecrated as monuments of ancient wisdom. But this did not happen automatically with the passage of time. Rather, the law texts were, can were canonized by the accretion of glosses and commentary around them. In his paper on the text and transmission of uh, Irish law, Professor Kelly has examined various types of page arrangement of Irish law texts as found in the manuscript from the later Middle Ages. As Martin Irvin has argued, glosses and commentary of any kind shift the text from simple signifying vehicle to an object of analytical discourse and create a, a, hier a hierarchy which promotes the canonical text to an authoritative status. It is the glosses and commentary that constitute the canonical text as the fountain of authority and invite them into a dialogue between the past and the present in order to update them for the changed social, society, the social reality. The physical misanthropy renders this dialogue visible and develops an intellect intellectual depth 
which places the canonical text and the scholia together in a traditional constellation. Despite the um, gradual eclipse of canonical text in later manuscript copies, the dialogue lived on in a court pleading composed perhaps in the 16th century, which might have witnessed the final stage of native Irish legal writing. Earlier texts are not only cited extensively, but are also clearly marked, paraphrased, and interpreted in light of the present circumstances. By incorporating early texts and enshrining them as authoritative and binding, the pleading itself becomes a continuation of the textual tradition and shares its authority. Early Irish law texts were intrinsically bound to the other branches of the Shanifas. This intertextuality exists at several levels. The traditionality of law texts, regardless of the, their actual provenance, age, and theme, is constructed by the power of intertextuality, constantly being reaffirmed, renewed, and extended as new texts join the Shanifas. I believe this is the secret of the longevity and vigor of the Irish legal tradition that thrived for more than a millennium. And this tradition, indeed, like the scholarly legacy that Professor Kelly has bestowed and will keep on bestowing us, is an ever new one. Inshallah, bis nur. Thank you very much. Thank you.